I think we're ready, Phil. You want me to start off? Yep. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever in the world you may be. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this conversation on transformation with a very distinguished guest speaker. As you know, the electric power industry is no stranger to transformation, and that's the topic of our discussion today. Our member companies and EEI itself are committed to a cleaner, smarter, stronger energy grid that continues to provide customers with affordable and reliable electricity. EEI also recognizes that the, the, very, uh, the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion in our industry and embracing the different backgrounds only make us and our communities and our customer base stronger. That's why we at EEI emphasize global collaboration and partnerships as a key part of our work sharing best practices from one another. Our industry is uniquely equipped to respond to global challenges like this year's COVID-19 pandemic and the greater challenge of decarbonization. EEI's international members are present in all regions of the globe and are driving transformational change in the industry. Our Power by Association is helping to accelerate these changes through our international partnerships and stakeholder engagement. Because of our commitment to the global energy transition, EEI is constantly seeking to hear insights and from thought leaders in a variety of fields to inform our membership and other industry stakeholders. And I'm honored to introduce our guest speaker today. Thomas Edison once said, you, who, who you are will show in what you do. It's something we actually have on the walls of our offices at EEI. Now, our speaker today, throughout his career, advising major corporations and authoring 20 books, most recently, Green Swans, The Coming Boom in Regenerative Capitalism, John Elkington has contributed greatly to the world of sustainability and business. He has been dubbed the godfather of sustainability. That's a compliment. Uh, and it coined the term triple bottom line, which had a major impact in advancing in advancing sustainable investment. Today, we are pleased to welcome John Elkington for a conversation with EEI Vice President for International Affairs, Dr. Lawrence Jones. It's great to, to see both of you virtually. And now, Lawrence, I will turn things over to you with your conversation with John. John, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Phil. And thank you again, John. Welcome to this uh, conversation at the EI with the international program, we look forward to what's gonna be a very stimulating uh, discussion. I think we're gonna kick things off with John, maybe giving a quick uh, presentation to just sort of a summarize the book and some of the key points, and then we'll jump right into the conversation. So over to you, John. Thank you, Lawrence, and thank you, Phil, very much for the uh, warm introduction. Yes, the Godfather image uh, uh, brings to mind sort of severed horse heads and so on. So <laughs> hopefully we won't have, uh, too much of that um, uh, today. So what I'm going to do, and this is always the magical moment where you wonder whether the wretched thing is going to work, is share screen. Now, Lawrence, can I just test with you that that is working? It is working, yes. Fabulous. Well, hello, everyone, wherever you are, whichever part of the world's surface you're currently uh, standing or sitting on. Um, I'm going to say a little bit right up front about almost the discount factors that you can apply uh, to what I'm about to say. So I'm a boomer. I'm 71. I've spent over 45 years uh, professionally in the environmental and then sustainability areas. Through that time, I've co-founded four what we'd now call social businesses since 1978. They all still exist, which has a lot more to do with other people than with uh, me. I have three uh, visiting professorships. Uh, I, I was astounded recently to calculate that I've uh, been a member of now over 70 uh, boards or advisory boards from major companies like Nestle through to venture capital funds and social enterprises. And as Phil kindly said, uh, I've uh, done uh, 20 books to date. Um, now that's interesting. The next slide is not, there we go. Um, and I, it's a great pleasure to be um, involved in this discussion today with Lawrence and hopefully uh, with the uh, Institute membership over time. As Phil said, this is the new book and I'll explain what green swans are. I'll also uh, try and explain why um, regenerative capitalism is a term we'll hear a lot more about. 
Um, this is a, a, a diagram I first came across in the early 1980s. It seemed to strike me, it's, well, it struck me at the time as a very good encapsulation of what was then called the environmental debate became the sustainability debate. So there is a, a reality, it's emerging all around us. Uh, every so often we're forced to wake up to it, but there are different sides of a debate that sort of ricochet back and uh, forth. Um, and in the midst of all of that, you know, I, 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 as, as has already been said, I, I have worked with a lot of companies over the uh, decades. And every so often you fall in love with the proposition that a particular company or brand comes up with. So, for example, uh, GE, General Electric, uh, I became fascinated by their eco-imagination uh, initiative, you know, and, and numbers like $70 billion uh, in the uh, sustainability or clean or green uh, area and now we see what was really sometimes going on behind the scenes so in 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 the world in which I um, occupy where it's between worlds you have to be a little bit careful at times of who you fall in love with now I was in Shanghai a couple of uh, years ago and I was on the 27th floor of a skyscraper looking down pretty much on this view but the water wasn't there or well, the river was there but not the uh, flooding and I was reading a report um, and it was about climate change. It was about the future of cities, coastal cities like Shanghai. Um, and what it said was uh, two degrees of warming, half more or less of Shanghai's population would find themselves uh, uh, put out, put, uh, pushed out of their homes. And at four degrees, which you know, increasingly people are sort of almost accepting as inevitable, it's pretty much the entire city's population. So the following day I went into a conference. I was on a panel with the author of the report and I said to her, she was a, a very senior um, member of the Chinese government, I said, I'm, I'm just reading this report where you say uh, Shanghai hardly has a future, but since I arrived here two days ago, I've seen more construction effort than I've seen pretty much in the rest of my life put together what's going on. And she said, well, we know, uh, but we're under intense pressure to uh, build. We don't, we can't currently see any way of uh, holding back uh, the flood tides, but we just hope that at some stage uh, we'll crack that one. Well, good luck to us all uh, in a way. And um, I'm just going to say something rather personal before I go on to the body of the talk. Um, right in the early 1990s, um, I got a cartoonist, Ingram Pym, who works still for the, Ingr for the Financial Times, to do this um, cartoon for me. And it shows a boardroom table. Uh, and, a, a, and a fish representing the natural world, uh, a woman representing the dispossessed, the, the poor, uh, the impoverished, and on the right-hand side, a figure, a robot. And at that time, it was pretty much a joke. And yet, uh, in 2014, as many of you will know, the first expert system, which is sort of a step towards uh, robotics, uh, was appointed to a board in Hong Kong. Uh, and you've got people like Salesforce now working on the Einstein um, expert system, very much designed to um, help boards tackle uh, the sort of challenges that they will experience in the coming uh, decades. And I think that's going to be necessary. Uh, but two years ago, almost exactly, I withdrew the notion of the triple bottom line. And that cartoon was a precursor of the triple bottom line. So economic and financial, social and environmental uh, value created or undermined or even destroyed was was what the the focus uh, was. A, the HBR editors told me this was the first time any management co concept had been recalled. You can't recall a management concept. Um, people have embedded it in their operations if you've been successful. But this was designed to be a provocation uh, to say to people, do we really think if we continue to work on this sort of uh, uh, multi-dimensional approach where a lot of the work is still uh, lip service, do we really think that that's going to deliver the sort of change that's needed, the systemic change? My view is it won't, but I do see a way around that. A couple of years ago, again, I was walking through uh, Copenhagen Airport when we could still fly, uh, and I saw this front cover of the Financial Times. And I'm, I'm not going to read it out. Many of you will have seen it at the time. And you'll also have seen the FT uh, building a platform around these sorts of um, 
uh, issues, challenges, opportunities, and so on, and that the quality of their reporting, and of many others in the space, Bloomberg and uh, others, um, really, really interesting. But this is where I think we are, and this is, in a way, why I think the incremental approach that Triple Bottom Line has often favored is not going to work. We're in a period where a whole series of things are going exponential. Now, most obviously, uh, the pandemic, COVID-19, uh, is doing that. But uh, behind that, and many cartoons uh, are now uh, showing this, uh, you, behind the pandemic and pandemics, uh, you have the uh, climate emergency, and behind that, you have the genetic diversity uh, emergency as well. Now, maybe, and this goes back to the, um, the, uh, the, the sort of expert system idea, maybe what uh, uh, Elon uh, Musk is now sort of showing us through Neuralink that maybe we'll all have chips in our brains and it'll all be sorted. Again, I'm not uh, completely counting on that. Now, let me just say a little bit about the exponential nature of the challenges that we face. I don't know how many of the organizations and companies uh, represented on this call uh, have signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals. I would expect most of them, if not all. Um, but one of the points I've been making, and you know, I work with the Global Compact, and, and or we work with the Global Compact, so I support the Global Goals. But one of the things I found very few companies properly understand is the nature of those um, goals. So if you look at just the first and second goals, no poverty and zero hunger, those are not incremental goals. I mean, even if you push the deadline out to 2060, 2070, those would still be exponential goals. Getting from where we are on those issues to where we would then uh, need to be. If you take this 2030 deadline, my God, these, these, these are just super exponential goals. And most people yet have yet, not yet properly, I think, woken up to that. Now, a lot of people have been saying COVID-19 is a black swan. And Nassim Nicholas Taleb, shown here, whose book, uh, The Black Swan, many of you will have read, came out in 2007, just before the uh, financial crash, has said, no, it isn't. Uh, because black swans, yes, they're outliers, they're, they're outside our normal experience. They do have an extreme impact uh, and they're rationalized in hindsight. Very often we think we've understood what just happened to us and we really haven't. But the critical element is, he said, uh, these things are a surprise. And he says COVID-19 was not a surprise. People have been predicting pandemics, uh, governments had set up units to deal with them. In the US, uh, one of those units was actually shut down. Uh, so we should have seen what was coming. So black swans are things that very often take us exponentially in directions that we don't want to travel. The green swan, at least as uh, we're just defining it, uh, these, are, these are events, their trajectories, their solutions, their mindsets, their policies uh, that take us exponentially, potentially at least, in directions that we do want to travel to outcomes that we really want to uh, see happen. Uh, in the world. Now, I'm not going to read these. Uh, these are the definitions that come uh, from the book. But many companies have been turning to us and individuals too, saying, we want to be a green swan. How can we be a green swan? And what we're saying, green swans are actually market uh, shifts. They're, they're, they're not individual companies. You can have companies that are moving in the right direction. You can have almost, to, to paraphrase, paraphrase the Chinese, uh, companies with green swan characteristics. And over time, and uh, that uh, earlier diagram showing exponential trajectory showed very often exponential start slow before they actually reach an inflection point and come through. So these are not trade-off situations. These are um, uh, moments in our hi collective history where we achieve very surprising what was uh, originally considered to be impossible uh, progress against uh, at least three of these um, uh, forms of value. And people often ask, okay, so give us an example of a green swan. Well, even though my own country rather idiotically is trying to extract itself very painfully from the European uh, Union, the European Union has its green plan. And this, when I last looked, was I think 1.82 trillion euros of support. So it's, it's, it's a recovery package, economic and social, but it's also very strongly uh, now skewed towards uh, green outcomes, sustainability, and so on. That, for me, is potentially at least a green swan trajectory. Now, I think electricity is central 
uh, to what's coming next, and probably even more than many of the companies on this call uh, perhaps acknowledge. But that electricity will not necessarily come from where we uh, have got used to it coming from. This uh, report comes out in a couple of weeks, it comes out from a group called Rethink X, uh, based in uh, London and Silicon Valley. And they're talking about a world that is absolutely transformed uh, in terms of where electricity comes from and how it's supplied. And within the 2020s, not simply this is going to be something for the 50s or 60s. So uh, recommended reading when it comes out. Um, and this is the sort of projection uh, fund, which is fundamental to that work. The, these projections were done by the energy analyst and science fiction author, and a very good one, Ramas Nam. Uh, and he, in 2010, put out some projections which people in the industry tend to rule out saying, you know, no way this is going to happen. Well, even his uh, ambitious forecasts were overtaken. Uh, these are his latest forecasts. If this is even borderline true, we're moving into a period where electricity will be endemic uh, in ways that we can hardly even begin to understand. So uh, many of your companies are very well placed for this, but I think the seismic shocks that will come from the scale of the disruptions uh, that I believe are coming uh, will unsettle even some of the best founded uh, companies. Now, about 10 days ago, a colleague of mine in um, London uh, spoke to 150 high net worth individuals um, in Germany. And this was a very major event uh, hosted by a, a wealth management bank. And one of the questions those high net worth people were asked was, if you're investing for a, a longer term set of outcomes and for impact, which is a, a term that we're hearing a lot more about, where would you put your money? And if you look at the four, number four position, you know, I'd put it in sh products and services and carbon sequestration. That's pretty much where we'd people, we, we'd, we'd expect people to uh, be focusing. But if you come up the, and, and, and you know, I'd, I'd like to shape the uh, public discourse. Um, that's where people have been. But I thought the top two priorities is very, very interesting. I want to shape markets and I want to shape sectors of industry and particularly around decarbonization and so on. And I think this is an early uh, signal, weak signal of where the um, agenda is now going. Now, just finally, um, we're working with a number of companies who do see this sort of future coming, don't totally know how they're going to make money out of it, uh, don't know how they're going to uh, help uh, support the necessary market uh, uh, shifts. But one of the ones that we've been working with is a Spanish company, Acciona, uh, and we've taken about 30 of their fast track leaders and brought them up to um, uh, through a process which exposes them to the next round of sustainability thinking. So the final slide is this one, and this is the sort of thinking that we've been uh, sharing with people like that and also testing with them. And this diagram uh, has been based on a whole series of uh, uh, discussions with companies and, and even with a environmental protection agency, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. And what it shows, and you'll notice that there is no defined timeline at the uh, bottom, is three time horizons. So there is one that we're coming out of now, and that's got lots of elements like shareholder primacy and a reliance on GDP metrics and ESG uh, investing starting to go mainstream. But that's, that's a sort of a, a world that was, it's a world that we've uh, grown used to, but in the longer, longer term, uh, you've got a very different agenda. You've got uh, an agenda where externalities are starting to be uh, priced in a very different uh, way, where waste uh, has been designed out of a growing number of uh, systems, where the educational business school uh, system and so on is starting to take on board sustainability in a very different way. And in the middle is the transition, the transformation zone, which is where we now find ourselves. And the 2020s are going to be uh, absolutely full of the sort of issues that we see uh, in the middle ground there. At the top, you'll see responsibility, resilience, and regeneration. So I recalled the triple bottom line, uh, you may remember. Uh, we've reintroduced it softly, gently, and so on, but saying it works and it can work and it can be useful if it moves beyond its traditional um, framing around responsibility. So yes, we want 
companies and industries to be uh, more transparent and accountable and to, to engage their stakeholders and all that good stuff. Uh, and now uh, with COVID-19, the responsibility agenda is radically expanding. You've got wealth divides, you've got tax havens, you've got all sorts of things shunting into that uh, agenda. But now the word you hear on more and more people's uh, lips is resilience. People are increasingly worried that our systems, economic, social, environmental, governance and political, are much more fragile than they had uh, assumed. And in a world where everything is connected to everything else, I think resilience is going to be absolutely central to people's thinking and hopefully uh, uh, action uh, priorities. Um, the only way you can properly uh, guarantee anything like resilience long term is regeneration. We've got to invest in uh, not just a recovery, but the regeneration of the economic, social, and critically environmental systems uh, that we all uh, depend on. So that's pretty much um, what I wanted to say. I just wanted to end by saying uh, thank you, Lawrence, for uh, hosting this. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. Thank you, John. Uh, I think you're going to uh, release your uh, sharing screen and we can both get back on camera. Uh, just for the audience, the listeners, if you want to have a question, if you have a question you'd like to ask John, please uh, make sure you enter into the chat box and I will uh, pick up those questions. And, and so we'll try to get in as many questions as possible. So John, uh, excellent presentation. I really like the last slide. We'll come back to that. Uh, but I think before we do that, I want to go to something that you talked about regarding capitalism, uh, reimagining, re resetting capitalism. Uh, in the book, um, in, a, in a foreword, Paul Pullman uh, talks about the, that capitalism needs to be reinvented. Davos talked about capitalism being reinvented. And you yourself, John, have talked about the fact that the state of capitalism today is unfit uh, for, for purpose. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and what needs to happen for capitalism to be, to be right for the time in which we live? Well, I, yeah, thank you, Lawrence. I, let, let me just put a public health warning out there before I try and answer your question. I went to university first time around to study economics. I gave it up after one year in 1968 because economics as then taught seemed to have very little to do with some of the big social and environmental issues I was um, interested in. And I, I regret it in a way because I think um, economics is starting to have some useful things to say uh, in this space. But the two uh, economists who I, I came away absolutely uh, seized with, one was uh, Nikolai Kondratiev and the other was Joseph Schumpeter, and they both said the same thing. And they were loathed by my economics uh, professors. They both said the same thing. There are very few straight lines in economic affairs. In fact, there are very profound cycles of investment and disinvestment. Um, and I think we're in, what, in the midst of one of those, a, a down cycle. In fact, the book, as you probably have seen, has a, a diagram, the first one, which talks about a, a U-bend. And, and it, this is not something that's going to be over in short order. Um, but some of you will see in the weekend uh, New York Times a full page ad, uh, which is basically celebrating, if that's the word, the end of 50 years of Milton Friedman's. Uh, thinking now. He was a brilliant man. He was very thoughtful. He has had a big influence on our world, no question. But some of his ideas, like the um, the fact that we can do without government, um, have taken us actually rather fast in some rather unfortunate uh, directions. So I think we're at an inflection point. I think um, uh, we're going to see in the next three to five years a lot more change in terms of uh, capitalism, uh, and it's uh, in its sort of, almost its sort of DNA than we might have assumed uh, was possible. Will this happen everywhere? Will it happen in China, in Israel, in uh, Brazil, and so on? Clearly not. But it's going to happen in some of the major uh, markets, and I'm quite looking forward to that uh, process. So um, take what everything I say with a pinch of salt, as we might say. But um, I think economics, the sort of master discipline of uh, capitalism, which is pretty much where I started, mm -hmm. is in the process of a really quite convulsive period of uh, change itself. So watch the space. And so, and, and, and so as you talk about the different regions, the different countries you mentioned, could we imagine a situation where if you took Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, for example, where you have 600 million people lacking access to electricity, 
poverty, you know, still widespread. Should we imagine where we have different forms of capitalism for different regions and countries? Because obviously a country that is more mature in terms of its infrastructure and its uh, political systems may have a different approach to capitalism in terms of how it's executed. So do you see a world where we have different forms of capitalism? And in that case, where do they meet those different worlds or those different forms? Well, it's interesting because I think the simple answer is to say clearly that's the world in which we already live. I mean, we have um, market uh, and stock market directed um, forms of capitalism, and even those are different between uh, different practicing countries. We have uh, the sort of state controlled enterprise capitalism that you find in places like Saudi Arabia. We have um, you know, Politburo, in effect, forms of capitalism, as in China. We have kleptocracies uh, run riot in countries like uh, Russia. Uh, and then you go to places like Sicily, and the mafia is a form of capitalism, and if you want to see it that way. And, and then you go to Africa, and Africa is a very big place, as you well know. And, and, and you find every form of uh, capitalism, even in a country like South Africa. Um, so the, the simple answer is, yes, we will have that complex future because we've already got it. Then your question is, where do these different forms of capitalism meet? Um, it's not always comfortable. And I think quite often they meet through supply chains of major uh, brands, major corporations who um, put pressure on uh, companies in different parts of the world. Now, in recent times, that's often been in places like uh, Asia and Vietnam or Thailand or India or wherever, Pakistan. Um, but I think that is now also being redirected towards uh, Africa. But one of the questions that I think we might get into is whether we believe globalization in its current form, which has directed most of that or shaped much of that sort of interchange between the different forms of capitalism and non-capitalism, uh, is going to last. And I think uh, globalization is going to unravel to a much greater extent than most of us currently uh, uh, hope or imagine. Um, and if that's the case, then the diversity of capitalisms, the localism of different forms of cap or localization of different forms of capitalism uh, is going to make the, the future extremely hard uh, to predict. That doesn't mean that you won't have people still struggling to be global actors. Uh, of course, we're, we'll all be trying to do uh, that in one way or another. But uh, I, I think with this U bend that we're headed into, it, it will take at least 12 to 15 years uh, to clear. It's one, of the, it's one of these long wave economic cycles that people like uh, Kondratiev and Schumpeter uh, talked about. I think very insightfully, but not that their thinking was not at all popular. In fact, uh, you, you'll know, but Stalin had uh, Kondratiev shot because um, he said that capitalism would come back much stronger after the Great Depression, whereas Stalin just thought that was the end uh, for capitalism. Now let's get on to what Marx was um, prescribing. I think it's interesting because then listening to what you just said in terms of the uh, globalization and capitalism, maybe we should also start talking about uh, a new form of globalization, right? Because there will still yeah. be some degree of globalization, but a different kind. Well, that brings me to the topic regarding where do, they all, where do these meet, these different forms of capitalism? And one thing I want to talk about is the issue of me metrics and measurements, right? Yeah. Uh, one of the things the book does very well is laying out a sort of a, the analytical framework in terms of how this sort of a green swan uh, concept can evolve. But then can we use the old metrics of today's capitalism for tomorrow's capitalism? And specifically, I'm thinking about you know, things like GDP, uh, you know, uh, the, the quarterly earnings reports that we have every, every, in most countries. I mean, do these things have to evolve to be able to be ready for the new capitalism that you envision? Look, as the Australians would tend to say, Lawrence, I mean, I, uh, who knows? And I don't want to dismiss the genius of capitalism as, as it's evolved over the uh, decades and even uh, centuries. There are many things that capitalism does extremely well. Mm -hmm. And there are many forms of measurement which have evolved over time, which actually serve us uh, very well. I think the problem with, that we face now is that there are many things that capitalism as currently configured 
absolutely ignores, you know, that question of externalities, what is and what isn't uh, an externality. Um, I think there was a very interesting announcement this um, week. Uh, Hank Paulson, uh, the former Treasury uh, Secretary, uh, many of you will have seen it, but um, announced the need, was, I saw this in the Financial Times, but I'm sure it was covered elsewhere, for a new asset class, new financial asset class. And what he was talking about was healthy soils, he was talking about pollinators. So all this, you know, the sorts of things that if you just look at a part of capitalism that's directed that, you know, food production and so on, absolutely ignores, absolutely has discounted. And I, I, I sort of mean the word discounted uh, clinically um, for a very long time. So this is almost a cultural revolution and that's contaminated language, I know, but it, there is something that's going to have to happen in the brains of investors and that means all of us, in the brains of uh, business leaders, and over time that will mean many of us, and certainly many on this uh, call. Uh, and I think one of the things that gives me a certain amount of uh, confidence is that the younger people I now meet in business and in financial institutions around the world, many of them see the sustainability agenda as that's our agenda, why wouldn't we do this sort of stuff? Now, that, it's not, it's not um, uh, ubiquitous, uh, that, but I think younger people get this and they really want to know how they uh, deliver against that. When I contrast that, I mean, for example, I'm thinking about the electricity industry. In the 1980s, I worked with what was then called the Central Electricity um, Generating Board, the CGB in the UK, as it was going out of the public sector into the private sector. And I think back to the way in which uh, electricity industry people at that stage thought about environmental issues. And at that stage, we were talking about acid rain and you know, uh, acidification of lakes in the shield country of Scandinavia or Canada or whatever. And there was an absolute brute denial that any of that stuff was real or if it was, it had anything to do with the industry. And over a very short period of time, that shifted. Now, we're going through a similar process with climate change. It's taken longer uh, because the uh, effects are rather more diffuse. But the accelerative curve underpinning that uh, developing emergency is much, much harsher than even we saw with things like uh, acid uh, precipitation. So I, I think I've seen this pattern of initial denial, it's not us, uh, it's not our fault, go away, uh, leave us alone, uh, to a point where people start to say, it does seem to be a reality. We're not sure how much of it can be uh, laid at our door and, and, and who else is uh, responsible to the point where people say, oh, holy cow, uh, you know, this is the future. How are we going to step up and develop um, strategies and technologies and business models that properly address all of this. And I think just finally on that, that point, I, I think we're at a very strange point in all of this. And so I, I, I've been fascinated since I was a child with uh, uh, technology. I've, I was editor for 15 years of a genetic engineering newsletter as a hobby. But, um, and so I, I went through that first great wave of biotech um, uh, investment. And we're coming to the point now, whether it's autonomous vehicles, the internet of everything, uh, artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, I, I could go on listing uh, almost indefinitely, novel materials and so on and so on. These things are becoming a reality and around them, a set of novel business mo models are starting to uh, form. And so I think in the next 15 to 20 years, uh, we're going to see a very different economy uh, evolving. Now, if if, if the incumbents fight it in today's markets, in today's world, all that means is it slither off and go elsewhere and evolve where, where the conditions are, are friendlier. And that's how every time there's been one of these great, great sort of industrial transformations, the center of economic gravity has shifted. It's generally gone east. And I think it's now going from California to uh, China and so on. I don't particularly promote that, but I think that's the reality. Yeah, and, and, and you, you talk about, you know, the, the younger generation and you, we've talked about capitalism. One of the things I wanted to get into, which you told, we'll talk about in the book, John, is the interaction between capitalism, democracy, and sustainability. 
yeah. and, and, and specifically given our industry and many other large infrastructure industries are you know, driven or by regulation and public policy. And so can you talk a little bit about what you see as the role in terms of democracies, or more specifically governments, public policy, in, in accelerating uh, this new capitalism that we envision? And how can they, on the other hand, take, uh, do things the wrong way that inhibits uh, yeah. this occurring? So the role of public policy government in the context of this new uh, capitalism that we see, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the book, um, as you kindly reference, uh, has three big themes towards the end, and, uh, and, and one of them uh, is capitalism and its future and how we get capitalism with green swan characteristics. Another, the second, is uh, democracy, same formulation, how do we get democracy with green swan characteristics. And the third, which may be a surprise to some of our audience, is sustainability. I think if there's any industry that needs massive disruption, it's the sustainability uh, industry, which I've helped uh, pioneer over the last 40 years. And the reason I say it is because it's been forced by just bitter daily experience to go incremental. It's gone for the responsibility agenda when it should have been uh, thinking about disruption and about regeneration. Now, not to say that people weren't and, 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 and um, throughout much of that time, but, but the, the center of gravity shifted towards let's accommodate with the current system, learn how to work with it. It has deep pockets so it can actually uh, you know, finance some of the things that we want uh, to do. To your question about governments and public policy, the reason why I think Friedman, Milton Friedman uh, was seriously wrong, you may remember the uh, comment that uh, at least is attributed to him, that if you put the federal government, I'm talking the United States, in charge of the Sahara, we'd run out of sand in five years. Um, you know, it's a lovely uh, a phrase and uh, sticks in the memory, but anyone who's watched what happened with the United States in the um, New Deal period, anyone who's watched uh, the spread of mass education in any developed country or mass vac vaccination in any uh, country or the enfranchisement of women in any country or you know, racial, um, the bridging of racial divides and so on. It's always but always government that does uh, that. And, and uh, no, I'm not even mentioning NASA and the, uh, the, the, the real moonshot and so on. So every time we've had one of these uh, big transformations, you think of the internet, government played an absolutely crucial and foundational uh, well, now I don't think that government is properly configured for what comes next. Um, and I think much of the uh, work that has been done to regulate business is still necessary, but it put, so the last two days I spent working with the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. They have a very different approach out of 40 EPAs around the world that they're linked to. They're the only one that is moving away from regulation to how do you promote sustainable growth? and really building that whole strategy uh, around that. Well, that's just one microcosmic element of what governments have to do. And there's a very um, interesting and relatively small um, media stroke social enterprise platform based in London called Apolitical. And what Apolitical do is to track emerging best practice in the public sector, in public service around the world and then they aggregate it and then they sort of uh, spread that out to uh, practitioners. And I, I think that's, there's a revolution that's needed in government and public policy. And I think some of those sort of platforms will play into that. But in the end, uh, these sort of revamps, these resets, these restructurings, these reinventions of, in this case, government and public policy, they come out of crises. And we're in one of those crises. We're in many countries, uh, governments have singularly failed uh, to do what their scientists warned them would be necessary uh, to do. Now, some of that's just political, some of it's just incompetence. But if we don't have governments to properly and effectively and in a timely way address the systemic uh, crises that are coming at us, why do we even have them in the first place? As I said, we do need them, and therefore we actually need to reshape the way that they, um, they think and they operate, and also vote for <laughs> different styles of governance over time. Mm -hmm.
Uh, we're, I'm going to invite the audience to submit questions. We have mm. a few coming in here. Uh, but before we get to the questions, one, one other thing I want to follow up on regarding government. So we talk about exponential change, and you call yeah. this exponential 20s uh, in, in the book. How do we get this sort of a 10x thinking in government? Because I'm, I'm impressed by what the Scottish uh, EP is doing. But is yeah. there a way we can sort of uh, move the thinking within government to be almost as 10x uh, as they put in place public policy, similar to what we see in organizations in the, in the private sector. Can that same mindset go to government or is this just impossible? Well, anyone who wants uh, an answer to that would be well advised to go to places like Singularity University and Google X and um, XPRIZE Foundation and so on. because. You know, California in particular is richly endowed with uh, organizations thinking in that uh, direction. They're largely thinking about private sector applications of exponential thinking, but absolutely no reason why uh, what starts off in public sector areas like education and healthcare on transportation can't actually spread into other areas over time. It's very difficult in a way because we want our governments to be safe. We don't want them to make ridiculous experiments with our futures and so on. We want them to be predictable. We want them to be reliable. We want them to be you know, efficient and effective and all those good things. And when we start to talk about 10X, yes, you can, you can, you can see that in agencies and EPA, you could see it in a space agency or whatever, but now even now you start to see the private sector, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and others sort of starting to overtake, at least for the moment, complement uh, the public sector uh, provided space um, activities and services. I think, who am I to say, but if, if, if I, I was trying to think about how governments might, and politicians, political leaders might over time, over the next 10 to 15 years, might um, start to ramp up uh, the exponenti exponentiality uh, of the governments, it may be uh, that we would take uh, useful uh, advice from the the, the, the the space program where very broad um, targets, visionary targets were set. And then to some degree, you know, with all sorts of engineering uh, specifications and so on, but people were left to find their own way towards those targets. And I think we're at a very interesting and challenging point in all of this where broadly as the sustainable development goals uh, sketch, we know roughly what we should be doing uh, but we don't yet know properly how to do it and we don't know who's going to pay for it and how it's going to be valued and rewarded and incentivized and so on. So I think I think governments have to set stretch targets, but not be too specific about how they're going to uh, be delivered and by whom, because I think one of the things that the digitalization of everything has now given us is a point where every living room has become a laboratory. Uh, you know, and, and, and solutions to some of our biggest problems may well come from you know, garages, uh, it would be conventional, but, you know, sort of young people's bedrooms and so on. Um, it used to be, uh, you know, Harvard dorms, but um, now it could pop up anywhere. And to your point about sub-Saharan Africa, I think one of the things I personally expect to see is an explosion of innovation across Africa, because there is no way that Africa can get where it needs to get from where it currently uh, is without doing a lot of this stuff itself. So, you know, there's going to be that uh, felt pressure and need uh, will be, it'll be fascinating to see how people step up to that challenge. Let, let's get into uh, one question that has come up here, uh, has to do with the, tri the triple bottom line that you coined and then you recalled. Yeah. Um, and now we have this movement of environmental social governance ESG which yeah. comes which actually comes after we had environment social economics so we have all of these terms coming back what's different now why is ESG ticking off in your view or will we see ESG be recalled and then maybe the resilience re you know regeneration will come back to the fore because it seems as if right now everyone is attacking or talking about ESG, there are metrics all over the place, there are templates for reporting. Yeah. Why now? What, what do you think? What's the catalyst? 
But it's another one of these exponentials uh, where for a very long time, nothing seems to happen, at least if you're in the mainstream on the 27th floor of a tower block or in Wall Street or whatever. And I've, I've worked now for over 30 years in sequence with I think nine socially responsible investment funds, ethical investment funds and so on. And they gradually got bigger and bigger and then it's crossed over into the uh, mainstream. Um, and I think what's happened is that, yes, there's a blizzard of different metrics and indicators and so on uh, being competitively offered by different people in this space. But what's happened is it's got to the good enough space point where uh, some of the ESG metrics are good enough to distinguish between poor performers and, and, and better performers. So one of the things that I think people have found quite striking is that um, the uh, performance of many of the ESG funds, not all, uh, through the COVID-19 uh, crisis has been distinctly better. Uh, and it's been better because it's, it's uh, that uh, analysis is, is probing deeper uh, for different qualities in the culture and leadership and so on uh, of companies. Now, to your point, um, will ESG uh, be challenged? By God, I hope so, because, you know, I, I was part of the founding group around the Dow Jones Sustainability Index is a very long time ago, and I was nine years involved uh, in that. And some of you, your uh, audience may remember a point where uh, Volkswagen were appointed the sector leader in the automotive um, area just two weeks before Dieselgate uh, broke. So, you know, <laughs> even the best intentioned ESG analysis does not tell you everything about companies. And I was on a call last night with a very uh, major um, Scandinavian energy company that is, that is in a, a, a transformative um, uh, process. And one of the things they've noticed is suddenly in their investor rela relations um, meetings and roadshows, investors are starting to ask lots of questions about ESG and sustainability, and they want to know about the competence of the board and stuff like that. But the person we were talking to said, no, you often feel that these people don't really understand what they're asking for. I mean, it's a herd instinct. Everyone suddenly knows they've got to do it but they don't know why they're doing it uh, uh, and they don't necessarily know what use they'll put that information to. But once they start to get that information, it's going to be used in potentially very powerful ways indeed. So any movement, any industry that is uh, nascent, uh, emergent, needs to be continuously challenged. You know, it's uh, one of the lessons of total quality uh, management and ESG is no different. And already at the leading edge of ESG, you have impact investment coming through. Very, very different again from ESG. And if I had to put my money, and I just have, I just taken our family pension portfolio and I've reinvested it out of the SRI funds, out of the ethical investment funds, into what I think may well be the uh, future. And particularly companies that have a, a lesser negative impact and a stronger uh, and potentially exponentially growing positive impact over time. You're on mute. Yes, got a few questions coming in and, and hopefully we can get through them uh, with the well, 15 minutes we have left. So one specific question actually comes from, uh, I believe, uh, a college student on the line, actually, uh, who's sending the question here. Uh, and, and her question is, uh, how do you propose that we convince those who are afraid and skeptical of reinventing capitalism that it is in everyone's best interest, including their own, to do so? Well, it's a lovely question, and I wish I had a glib, easy answer. I don't, because cultural revolutions, and I said earlier on, I think that's what, what we're in the midst of, are very difficult. And one of the things I expect to see in the next few years is an intensification of the defensive uh, uh, <laughs> lobbying uh, by vested um, interests. So, for example, I, I worked many, I mean, decades ago with the asbestos industry. Um, from outside, trying to tell them that what they were doing was wrong. Um, and as we got to the point of those materials being banned, their lobbying intensified and became dirtier and dirtier over time. Now, I think we're going to see the same with coal. I think we're going to see it with other fossil fuels. 
uh, I think we're already seeing it. Um, and one of the most energetic uh, and emotional exchanges I ever had in my professional life was with Rex Tillerson when he was CEO still of um, Exxon Mobil. And I was on stage talking about in uh, Stavanger in Norway about the lobbying that uh, Exxon in particular had done over the years um, on climate change. And he stormed into the back of the room uh, and, and basically roared over 300 nonplussed um, uh, Scandinavian uh, oil industry heads. That's a goddamn lie. Well, two weeks later, we saw that it really wasn't, uh, that it really was the reality. Uh, yeah. And there have been a bunch of people, well-known brothers and so on, who've been funding a lot of this uh, activity. So I think to the question, this is going to get nastier before it gets nicer. It's going to get cloudier and more complex before it actually comes out uh, the other side, because this is a battle. Uh, but what's really interesting me, I've worked, uh, again, uh, for companies like BP and Shell, Statoil and so on, European uh, energy companies largely, uh, over a very long time. And they've clinically denied time and time again that they will have stranded assets. No, we're too bright. We're too intelligent. We know that we have risks, but we're going to manage them uh, really, really well. Trust us. And now you've had both BP and Shell before them. Uh, writing off tens of billions of dollars of assets because they're now either stranded or about to be stranded. Now, very largely that is COVID-19, but they're by extension saying, you know, there's a systemic crisis and we've got this much, much bigger one coming at us in the climate emergency. We've got to start uh, preparing us. Now, I watched John Brown as CEO of BP go through the process of trying to green up uh, that company, and it wasn't totally successful. But I think we may actually see Bernard Looney, the current CEO. Uh, to, I, my sense is he is really committed uh, to transformation. And if that succeeds, BP will survive. But if it doesn't, BP will not survive. And you know, even these very big uh, companies and brands that we, we, we um, have known and grown up with, will disappear. And ExxonMobil has lost 60 something percent of its value in very short order. Now, I could crow having had the, uh, the collision with, with, with Mr. Tillerson, but I just think this is symptomatic of what is starting to happen all around us. I think electricity will come out of this really, really well, but I think the people supplying electricity to us all will be very different from the people that we're currently uh, used to. You mentioned electricity, and I want to get into one green swan you mentioned in the book, uh, which is electric vehicles. Uh, you, you, yeah. you represent them as one of the green swans and this whole e-mobility and what's happening. Um, what, what is going to be critical for us to see uh, a mass adoption of EVs? Do you need a combination of government policy as well as innovation? What, what do you think is necessary for EVs to really take off globally, not just in the sort of more OECD countries? Yeah, so I, I think apart from charging points um, and the price point uh, problem with electric vehicles, um, uh, there are many people who would say the technology that we need is already there. Now, I have a colleague who um, writes extensively about electric vehicles. He has 300,000 LinkedIn uh, followers. It's not primary part of what he does, but just to show his influence, his view uh, and he's dealt with the EV industry for a very long time, is that everybody who has an automotive, you know, an internal combustion engine car now, if they were to um, replace it with an EV, that would be an absolute, my term, screaming nightmare. Because, uh, yes, it's a green swan that we move towards electric uh, forms of mobility, but actually we'd be far better off doing it to public transit systems than to uh, individual uh, private forms of mobility, and even where that's necessary, uh, EVs are coming with a very major set of headaches. So I talk about green swans, yes, but I talk about some of those green swans having black feathers. Exactly. In the case of e, yeah, in the case of EVs, and you know some black swans have green feathers, but um, in the case of EVs, um, uh, it's cobalt and it's nickel and it's all of the. Are, are we going to? Uh, endure sort of human rights abuses in Central Africa? Are we going to uh, plow up the uh, ocean bed to get at these sort of uh, metals and rare earth minerals and so on? The likelihood is if we go electric, uh, we will. And I was on a call just the uh, last week with a, 
um, an Australian bank, uh, who have a massive investment in data uh, centers and so on. And what's really beginning to start uh, to spook them is the electric waste, not just sort of iPhones and things like that, but these huge great clods of um, uh, information related technology, which are going to become redundant. What then are they asking? What do we do with this stuff? So electrification is, is a wonderful idea if we do it well, but um, the early uh, ex um, evidence from the next wave uh, at least gives us uh, reason to sort of pause and reflect and think, if not that way, then how? So a uh, couple of questions, and I knew this was going to happen towards the end, all the questions start coming in. <laughs> but let me just drop one here. Uh, there's a question regarding India about one grid, one sun. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I know the questioner and I can reach out to them and try to address that because they're asking yeah. about how to talk about one sun, one world, one grid in the context of sustainability. And I think we can discuss it offline. But there's one that just came in, which comes back to this rare earth metal conversation in the sense that the question is, with China in control of most of the RAEs and critical materials, both mines and manufacturing, do you see this as yeah. a potential or ex existential concern uh, or opening for a new world war because of minerals, no longer oil? Just quickly on that. That's the geopolitics well, of this. <laughs> This whole thing. A couple of things. Uh, uh, well, it's wonderful that more questions are coming in. If anyone doesn't have their question answered and remains interested in, in, in having an answer, my email is john at volans, V O L A N S dot com. Uh, I'll answer any uh, question uh, sent to me. On India, which you were skipping over, but I, I, I think India has a massive, massive opportunity with solar and with. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, a single sort of um, subcontinent wide grid, if they could get there. I, 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 there are many, many, many challenges that stand in the way. But in terms of a, a leapfrog opportunity, uh, India certainly uh, has uh, that. Um, sorry, I've, I've skipped off into the undergrowth and slightly forgot. Well, it was just the issue the... about China and, and the rural Okay, got it, got it. That sort of a... so, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think China, I, I, I've worked there, I've, I've talked to people in the Politburo, I, I, I can't claim to be expert, but it's worried me profoundly uh, for quite some time, because if I go back 10 years, I had co uh, conversations with uh, government ministers in Beijing, and, and they would say, uh, we've studied the rise of Prussia, uh, we're not going to do that. I think they're in exactly in the process of doing that, coming up against uh, an incumbent power and triggering, triggering all sorts of antipathies and so on, and hostilities and competitive uh, behaviors. So one of the reasons I think uh, globalization is going to continue to suffer, it's not suddenly going to tick back, is because that superpower rivalry, it doesn't matter who gets in, in November in the United States. Um, this is something that is an emergent reality. And as long as Xi is there, and I, you know, I, I'm sure he has many strengths, but he is somebody who is not uh, well-versed in how you do international diplomacy in a way where people end up loving you. So if I had to make one uh, prediction about where we're headed, I think within the next five to 10 years, we will have a major uh, war. Um, it won't be like the Second World War. It'll be through cyber warfare. It'll be through robotics, all sorts of stuff. We've seen it with um, refineries in the Middle East where drone attacks denied by everyone. Um, so I think we're headed to war, but around that, I think there is this such a seismic shift in our technologies, our mindsets, and so on, uh, that I, I think actually, oddly, we can come out of this uh, very much stronger. So yes, this is existential, and in a way, sustainability has been seen to have be a, a nice to have. We're now in a moving into a future where it's becoming mission critical. So if I, if I were to take the more optimistic view, John, uh, trying to wrap things <laughs> up here, uh, I would say that, um, yes, the predictions of the way we might be headed from a geopolitical standpoint is concerning, but I have hope in the future of, 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 of the planet because of the younger generation, the student that asked that question, for example, and, and maybe it's good to be aware of the risk of things going crazy but we could take actions now to move us from the abyss, right? I mean, what you're saying is we could get there, but you're also saying we should try to think of how we avoid getting there. So it's not a, it's not a con con conclusion that we will get there in terms of uh, you know, geopolitical issues, 
but we can avoid it by taking into consideration some of these ideas around regenerative thinking and, and what's good for all of us as a global community and, and avoid getting to, to some of these uh, political strives and, and global political yeah. issues, right? So we can avoid I, I, it. I, I, I was, no, we can't avoid it. I, I, no, you look at Siberia and these great burps of uh, methane now coming out of the permafrost. You look mm. in at the uh, uh, Greenland uh, ice sheet, which is beginning to collapse. Um, you, in different parts of the world, this is actually moving into a different phase and it's got an accelerative function. So I would be like a doctor telling somebody they didn't have cancer just to make them comfortable. I would be delusional and misleading and not serve the patient if I said this is going to get better in any time soon. I think we're going to have to fight for this and it's a pan-generational project. And in a way, I, I could say, if I were a pessimist, I don't envy the uh, younger generation. But actually I do because what the, the challenge that we face, they face, is extraordinary. And, and the, the, oddly, the, the people who I've talked to in my life who've been most satisfied, fulfilled, have been those that have gone through some extraordinary existential moment where everyone is sort of in it uh, together. So that's the optimistic view. I think the Institute will be crucial in making that happen. And I think your members uh, will have a really, really, really important role to play. Good well, let's end, on, let's end on a note that I wanted to begin with, which was, this is number 20 of your book. 20, 20 books have been written. Uh, uh, and I went back and I looked at some of them uh, in terms of the content and I saw a pattern of most, almost like an evolution of your ideas over time, going back to the guide you put on, the green guide and, and some of the other work you've yeah. done. So um, I always like to be the first to welcome people back to the EEI International Platform to have a conversation. What's next? after the green swans what do you have in the in the works after green swans because i'm sure you do have something in the works well as it happens i've started work on my next book uh, i i don't envisage it coming out until early 2022 but what i've started to do is to look back at work i started in 1994 looking back to 1970 and looking at the big societal pressure ways that in, have influenced first government uh, and then business and now financial markets and there have been five of those uh, waves to date. We've mapped them and we've you know, done survey work and all sorts of things around that. I think there are two further waves coming. And the first one, um, I mean, you, you, you could put all sorts of brands on, 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 on these waves. And the most recent one probably kicked off towards a peak around the time when the Pope was speaking up about climate change, when the UN was coming up with the Sustainable Development Goals, when the Paris climate uh, um, event summit happened uh, and then you had Greta Thunberg I mean how extraordinary a six, 15 year old uh, 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 originally standing up in front of the United Nations in front of the World Economic Forum and telling people that what they were doing was a betrayal a betrayal of younger people's uh, interests um, what an extraordinary time we're living in and I think that wave uh, may peak and it may fall back as all previous ones um, uh, have, but I think there's a sixth wave already coming through. And as, as, as you go further up the curve in a way, there is an exponential curve at the heart of all of this. These things, crack, the, 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 the periodicity, the time period between these waves actually concentrates, concertinas. And I think the next one is going to be very much around impact. It's going to be around how do you measure your point about metrics and indicators and so on how do you not just uh tell the nice stories the fairy tales about what impact you're having in the world but how do you do the calculations which enable you not only to communicate uh, honestly uh, although that's sometimes a, a slightly sort of foreign concept these days but uh, how you change your business and evolve it over time such that it delivers uh, the new forms of uh, value that people will increasing not only want uh, but demand and then beyond that impact uh, wave I think we already see the outline of uh, the regeneration uh, wave Paul Hawkin who quite a number of your uh, members of your audience will know is is uh, writing a book uh, which will come out um, uh, late next year um, which will be, be called regeneration and he's somebody who very often has prefigured some of these big shifts um, in the change agenda uh, for business. Uh, he's also just written this piece, 
speech on regeneration for one of the world's largest companies, which will come out relatively uh, uh, soon. So I, I, I think that next uh, wave is already forming, but it's much harder to do multi-dimensional regeneration uh, than it is to do a little bit of reporting, a little bit of stakeholder engagement, a little bit of life cycle assessment, and so on. This, this is a, an existential uh, moment. It's, 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 the question I think we're all going to have to ask ourselves is, are we really serious about all of this? Are we going to step up? And if not, it's time to get out of the way. Well, John, on that note, I want to thank you so much for taking the time, because I know you're very busy including working on the next book, uh, to spend with us and the audience here at EI International Programs with EI members from all over the world listening in. Thank you to the audience. The book, again, is Green Swans. Uh, I highly recommend this book. Uh, be prepared to read it with an open mind and be prepared to challenge your own assumptions because John does a good job in making you challenge some of your assumptions. I really enjoy reading the book. I look forward to the next book. Um, we will make uh, John's presentation available as well as the uh, recording of this uh, webcast for those who might be interested. John, again, said his uh, email is available to those who want to reach out to him. And thank you so much. Uh, look forward to seeing you soon, John. And uh, hopefully the weather in London will be much better than it is here in parts of the U.S. Well, Lawrence, just quickly, I mean, I really enjoyed the conversations that you and I have had um, in building up to this event. I really look forward to continuing those uh, over time. And to everyone listening, thank you for being involved in this. Good luck with your efforts to step up. Uh, and please don't get out of the way if you uh, have got some really good thoughts and uh, solutions to all of this. By God, we're going to need them. Thank you so much, John. And goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.